Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. My special studio guest this week is Mr. Rick Avila, who is assistant director in the Dairy Commodity Department at NFO. Rick, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Very glad to be here, Bill. We will also be visiting with another guest, Mr. Dick Yule, a young dairy farmer who lives near Utica, New York, in Herkimer County. Dick Yule, a fine NFO member, has quite a story to tell about a rather disastrous fire that he suffered and how he has recovered from that disaster. Speaking of uh, Dick Yule's disastrous fire, Rick, he did have to recover and go back into the dairy business. Now, it would seem to me in this day and age that going into the dairy business would be a very expensive proposition. It sure is, Bill. I think that uh, if young gentlemen coming out of school, high school or college, uh, were hit all at one time with the total cost of going into the dairy business, uh, we would have very few young men into coming into agriculture mm -hmm. in dairying, and especially in, in uh, the eastern states especially. The total cost uh, usually is prorated over a number of years because a young boy gets into high school and he's in 4-H and he develops a few animals and pop handlings out a few more. And, mm -hmm. uh, so he's got a nucleus to start from. And uh, we find the dairy business uh, pretty much still uh, handed down father to son. Uh, the average age of dairy farmers in uh, quite a few areas across the country is up in close to the 60-year mark. Well, Pop's sort of on a downhill. He likes to taper off. And Junior can come in with uh, the sweat that Pop's put in for the number of years and sort of take over. Sure he can. And uh, without this uh, $130,000 or $40,000 or $50,000, I don't want to frighten you with those figures, but this is what it cost if a young man wanted to get into the dairy business uh, in the neighborhood of between one hundred and fifty and sixty thousand dollars uh... total investment in land machinery and livestock in terms of his potential in terms of the money he potentially can make the money that he is paid based on today's prices for his commodity would you say it's a good business proposition well, it certainly takes a hearty stock uh, of young man to, to really uh, be that adventuresome, I'll say, to, to take a gamble. And uh, if you're willing to work uh, 18, 19, 20 hours a day uh, for as long as 300 to 310, 15 days every year, uh, I would say yes, uh, it's worth the gamble as far as uh, uh, dairying today. But uh, if you're looking for a, as a business, strictly as a business, and you're looking at uh, agriculture and dairying especially as a business, uh, I would say that many people would be completely frightened off with the returns that they receive, even at today's prices, mm -hmm. uh, compared to the total investment and the, and the labor input and, uh, well, like your disastrous fire or weather conditions and things like that they have to put up with because the actual monetary returns, and of course this is what we're feeding our families with and we're uh, planning on the future with, uh, have not reached that uh, potential of other businesses, uh, non-agriculture businesses I'm referring to, because the return is somewhere in, uh, if you don't consider your labor input, around 6% return or 5% return on your investment. But uh, that's putting in 300 days a year free gratis, and I don't think there's too many employees or employers that do that. Not too many young people like to take a look at the future in that light, I no, would sir. say. No, sir, they don't. Bill, I, I don't want to be misleading and, and paint a completely gloomy picture as far as uh, young people into the dairy business. Uh, there are some bright spots on the horizon. What's NFO doing about it? Well, I think for the first time that the, the awareness of the American farmer, and especially the dairy farmer, that there, there is a, a rejuvenation uh, within the spirit of the, of the farmer not to be tied down completely seven days a week mm -hmm. to, uh, to his farming operation, that he can uh, acquire knowledge and uh, marketing principles and practices, and he can get out and uh, find out really what is involved in developing a good, sound agricultural picture as far as dairy marketing. And this the NFO has given the, the dairy farmers throughout the country with the vast number of meetings 
and seminars and uh, discussions that we hold uh, all over the United States in relation to get involved in your marketing. Don't let someone else do it for you. Do it yourself. You wouldn't send somebody out to sell your prize cow for you. You do it yourself. And this is the same thing with that product. It's your daily bread. It's your income. Get involved in it and, and uh, get your own return that you feel is necessary to stay in business. I guess that dairying agriculturally is perhaps the most confining part of it, isn't it? This is, this is very sad and very true. Uh, I think that if the farmer himself realizes that, that he is uh, pretty much burdened with a, uh, being tied into a uh, sort of a constrictive labor type situation, and that he has to build in his own protection uh, because the discouragement of working seven days a week uh, is, uh, is going to be there. You can go and sustain yourself maybe a period of 10 years. But after a while, it gets tiresome. Oh, and uh, I've known people that haven't had vacations in all their lives. They've milked continuously since 1939. Yeah. And they're, they're getting up and they're tired. So we've got to build into a program of pricing and marketing uh, that cost of labor which would include hiring someone at today's standards, mm -hmm. not at a dollar an hour, but at today's standards, so that we give this farmer that reprieve, so that the young man who's coming in and he sees Dad as a tired, worn out, haggard individual, he says, now that's not for me, but he can see uh, a different picture on the horizon. And this is what we're attempting to do through our contractual arrangements, that that young man says, well, I'm not going to be worn out, worn out at 45 like Dad was. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to be on the go. I'm going to be a businessman. I'm going to have hired labor, and I'm going to be able to pay them. And I'm going to set up now when I'm young and work with an organization that has these principles in mind. To get back to Dick Ewell in Herkimer County, New York, uh, the milk of that area goes to NFO's collection point at St. Lawrence, New York, mm -hmm. which uh, brings the subject up of the collection point. Well, Rick, what kind of progress has NFO enjoyed in the establishment of uh, milk collection points around the country? Bill, the, the collection point idea or concept is not new. It's been tried several times. But with the structure within the organization that we have, which we operate on a nationwide basis, where buyers who buy on that same basis over a wide area, uh, we're able to service these buyers through our collection points. It's extremely difficult as a salesman to go out and sell a product if you have to theorize when you can get the production together. If you bring it together in a collection point uh, and have a market for it, the buyer will say, yes, I want 100,000 a day or I want 200,000 pounds of milk. It's there, it's available. It's ready and willing to move. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have to go out and say, well, it'll take me three weeks or three months to get this production put together for you, uh, he's not as willing to sit down and say, well, uh, I'm ready to go with you at that point. Uh, so consequently, we have our production, and we're doing this over a very, very wide area, from Idaho to uh, Massachusetts and New Hampshire. We have some new collection points up in that area. Uh, and it's, the, to me, the revitalization of the industry, uh, of our dairy industry, because when you see these farmers working shoulder to shoulder, to not only bring their production together, but actually to get these facilities ready to handle that production, and, and also maintaining quality. Uh, d getting involved in all these concepts, it's, really, uh, it's really a very enterprising uh, situation for dairy farmers, and it has rekindled an effort for them to, to be involved in, in uh, marketing their production. So Rick, the collection point, such an integral part of your dairy strategy at NFO, has made it possible for you to have a very good effect on depressed milk areas and have, at the same time, no harmful effect on high-priced areas. Would you explain that? This is very true, Bill. The collection point concept is not new, and, and moving production from one area to another has been done over a considerable period of time by many organizations. The main thing that we must consider in the, in the is the timing of the movement. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the production that's in the heavy producing areas, uh, four states in, in uh, the north, north central and eastern part, which is New York and Pennsylvania, and uh, Wisconsin and, and uh, Minnesota. 
And the production from these states is needed now, today, uh, in areas of the South and the Southeast. And uh, we are attempting to fill the needs of these areas with bottled milk, or milk used for bottling, without flooding those markets uh, and depressing farmer prices in those areas. And by working with the handlers in the areas who call NFO and sort of prorate their orders for milk from us that we can uh, fill on a day-to-day -day basis, have backup mm -hmm. supply for uh, various other markets. The cheese market's extremely good right at the present time, and there can be a lot of money generated back to farmers. This is a concept of, the, of having the versatility of being able to move east, west, north, or south with this production. And the farmers, in, instead of taking a what is left price in their local area, if it all went into manufacturing products, we can gear to the needs of uh, the dairy industry today mm -hmm. with the use and the flexibility of the collection point and raise price at the same time. Yes. Rick, uh, Dick Ewell is an old acquaintance of yours, is he not? He certainly is. Well, you know something? I'm going to give you an opportunity now to get reacquainted with your friend Dick Ewell. Why don't you join us and uh, let's visit with Dick on his uh, dairy farm at uh, Herkimer County, New York. Dick, uh, the reason for the new barn and the change of the appearance of this place was a disastrous fire in June of 1968. Tell us about that. Well, we, my wife and I were milking. We had all the cows in the barn, and the kids come down from the house and said the hay mow was on fire. And I went out and looked, and there, everything was in flames from upstairs up. Uh, we didn't smell it because of the updraft going up through the hay mow, and by the time we got the cows out, the barn was flat. We had quite a mortgage on the farm that we was on, and the barn was gone. We didn't know what to do, whether to build back or sell out or what. We looked into it a little bit, and we would never be able to get our money back out of it to even pay off the mortgage that we had, and yet we couldn't quite see putting all the money into a well, new barn. No, you were out of business uh, is, for all practical purposes, we, weren't you? We sure were. How big a herd were you milking at that time? We were milking about 50 cows then. So what happened? Well, the neighbors... All come in the next morning, and quite a few of the NFO members, and we moved the cows down to another NFO member down the road. Uh, we milked them in his barn in, that morning. And then uh, another neighbor let me have his heifer barn to milk the cows in the summer and until we could make up our mind what we was going to do. We went on about three months, and we still couldn't make up our mind quite for sure what we wanted to do. It was going to cost us thousands of dollars to rebuild. And all of a sudden, one day, Don Foster and some of the other NFO members pulled in here. There was about 20 of them. And they said, you get on the phone, start ordering some lumber. We're going to build you a barn. <laughs> and this is the way we started. And they went to work. They made, them, <clears throat> made, made up our mind for us. How long did it take uh, your crew of NFO neighbors and yourself to put up the new barn? Well, we started. It was the 20th of August when we started, and the 11th of November, the cows were in the barn. I see. How many NFO uh, friends and neighbors helped you on it? Well, it would be hard to actually say how many because there was probably 150, 200 of them all together. But it was from times it was anywhere from 5 to 20 here every day. And I understand that their wives came over and cooked meals and right, we, helped right along with the fellas. Right. We set up, an, or they did, they brought some concrete blocks and things, and we set up a pit out here, and we fried hamburgers yeah. and hot dogs for dinner, and, and they brought salads every day when they come. And, they just kind of rotated. Everybody helped a little bit. Well, now, Dick, this is a, a barn of uh, 40 by 170. Right. And uh, how much money do you suppose uh, the NFO labor force saved you on rebuilding? Well, we had this figured right out in the contract price, uh, and they saved between five and $6,000. Well, uh, good old neighborliness hasn't really gone, has Not it? really. These are just like brothers and sisters to us when they come. It... Uh, it bring tears in your eyes every day when you see them coming up the road. Really, it, there's no way there's no way in the world to explain it. It's just something that happened, and we can't get over it yet. It puts you back in business. It kept us in business, and right? In fact, uh, what has been uh, your uh, progress and growth here, Dick, uh, since that disastrous fire? You've added land, haven't you? We've had to. We uh, really couldn't make it on what we had here, and we thought the answer was to get bigger. So I've rented land from farm above me first, and that didn't seem to be the answer. We still wasn't uh, 
getting the income that we wanted. So I went ahead and rented the farm down below me down here. And I think we can see that one right off in the distance. <laughs> right. There's two silos there and a, and a big barn with a modern equipment. Yeah. And then I went ahead and I rented some land down below on the corner here, and I rented from the farm on the other side of me over here to keep young stock on. <laughs> well, Dick, is uh, getting bigger the answer? Not really. It uh, is... We've mentioned here once before, I don't know if we mentioned it since you've been here on the mic, but getting bigger, you have, it takes more labor, and all we've done, we've got bigger. We thought this was the answer to get bigger, to receive more money, to be able to get ourselves out of debt. And as we've got bigger and more modern machinery, that we've got farther in debt, and it's taken more work to do it, and we need a bigger labor force, and we can't find the labor to do it. Well, the answer is price, as you say. Right. And uh, where do you feel the hope lies for getting that price? National Farmers Organization. They have collective bargaining, and this is the only answer for agriculture. What has NFO done for you in terms of price in the last year, Dick? All right. We've uh, start right out with uh, all my feed, my grain, and everything I get through NFO at discount prices. This is one start that we've got. All my beef call cows and calves go through NFO marketing program where we receive well on a cow from $25 to $40 a cow more than a non-member is getting. Mm -hmm. This is a help. Uh, my main product is milk and through I've been to two or one federal hearing that we saved 18 cents on 55 percent of our production, 18 cents a hundred weight uh, that they was going to take away from us and the NFO fellows went down and testified why we couldn't afford to lose mm -hmm. us 18 cents and we come out on top on that hearing. Mm -hmm. They didn't take it from us. So this is a big savings right here alone. Uh, about $1,000 worth uh, on my own operation. We are working in our area here now at selling milk under a contract. It's going to put more money into the member's pocket. Where does your uh, milk go? Well, uh, I sell it right now to Herkimer Creamery, which uh, they deliver to down in New York City. It's bottled in, in New York City. Now that you've accumulated uh, this additional land, and now that you've grown, uh, how many acres are you farming altogether? 450. And w how large is your uh, cow herd? We have, uh, at the present time, 60 cows, and, uh, well, I guess there's about 45 or 50 head of young stock. Uh -huh. uh, this uh, livestock of yours is outstanding. I think that uh, they just look great. They are. They're real good cows. This was another factor that why we didn't sell them right after the fire, even though we didn't know what we was going to do with them. They're cows that we've worked all our life on to uh, breed them up. I started right from 4-H and FFA, ran mm -hmm. up through and raised them to get the production that we've got. We've got a 15,000-pound herd average now. Uh, about half of them are registered, and we just hated to see them go. You have a real good replacement program going, don't you? Yeah, we think it is. We raise quite a few and we aren't afraid to call, but uh, one of the reasons we aren't afraid to call is because of the NFO beef program. Mm -hmm. We can get a good price for the beef when we do call, and anything that isn't up to par, they just go out the barn. Yeah. Now, on your land, you're raising corn, and the corn looks good this year. What's it going to make, 100 bushels? It, uh, most of the corn that I've got will go into the silos for feed for the cows, mm -hmm. but the corn that I will pick, I have got hopes of it going between 95 and 100 yeah. bushels. But uh, most of it will be chopped and right into the silos for feed. Right. Now, what else are you raising on your land? Well, we have uh, alfalfa and clover hay, uh, which the first cutting goes in the silo on this, and then the second and third cutting yeah. is dry hay for the cows. Well, now, at this time, uh, uh, we have looked at your uh, alfalfa and hay field, and uh, it looks beautiful this time of year. How many cuttings have you had so far? We've had one. We're ready to cut the second now, and with a little rain and warm weather, we'll have one or two more cuttings. Mm -hmm. Now, you're also uh, raising some oats, aren't you? Right. Now, is, is this, are these oats fed to the cows? Uh, no, they're combined and mixed up into my own grain. I see. The grain that I get through the NFO, uh -huh. I get corn and wheat from them, and I mix these oats in it yeah. to finish out my ration. Yeah. Dick, speaking of machinery, as we were a while ago, you have no small investment in machinery here. Do you have any idea how much you have invested? In machinery alone, between fifty and sixty thousand dollars. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it's outdoors. It's uh, sitting outside. But this is because you just don't have any place to put it, isn't it? This is right. I bought the milk station here. Expanded a little bit again. I bought the milk station down the road here, over the hill, a little bit, 
uh, and I store some machinery in here, but it just isn't large enough. We lost a lot of my storage space when the barn burnt. I had a two-stall car garage here and a small machinery barn, and we just haven't been able to find the time or the money to rebuild. Mm -hmm. So, as you see, the machinery is sitting outdoors. Well, yours is truly a family farm operation, isn't it? That's right. She helps you all the time in feeding right. in the barn. And uh, you have four children, and That's right. uh, I guess all four of them help, too. Well, one's pretty small, but she does come down and she tries to help. How so, old are they, Dick? Uh, the youngest is three, and then five and a half, and seven, and ten. Yeah. Well, the older three, at least, are helpful. They do they? quite a bit. Save us a lot of steps. They do a lot of light work, smaller work, but it's work that we don't have to do. Isn't it almost an impossibility to hire good help? It's impossible. I've run ads in a paper for a hundred and a half a week and never even got a call on to them. Mm -hmm. It's just tough to, to get anybody. Right, it is. Well, let's talk a minute about uh, the barn itself. Now, this is uh, a 40 by 170 foot dairy barn, as we said earlier. Uh, could you describe to us exactly how your milking operation works? Right. The cows, it's a one-story conventional stanchion barn. The cows are put into the stanchion uh, for milking, and they're fed in the stanchions. And then in the wintertime, they're in the barn all the time. We let them out once a day for exercise. But they're fed and milked in the stanchion. Now, when we start milking, uh, we have to sanitize all the equipment before we start for a quality uh, mm -hmm. product. And then the cow's udders are washed and sanitized, and then they're milked with a pail-type milker. Now, this milker... Uh, from here, after the cow is done, we dump the milk into a pail or a dumping station, which goes through a glass line into the bulk tank and cooled there. Now, we have a total investment of just milking equipment and bulk tank alone of about six to $7,000 right here. It's, uh, and the USDA, the public health and everything, is, is getting a lot stricter and tighter than they were, and it's costing more money to keep things up uh, so that you do have a quality product. I believe in a quality product. Uh, I wouldn't want to send anything to market that I wouldn't want to drink out of my own yourself, tank. Right. Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, it costs money to do this. You used to be able to get away with uh, aluminum equipment uh, or tin. Now everything has to be stainless steel. And as you know, stainless steel costs money. Uh, and as we have to keep changing our equipment to modernize and, and meet the public health, mm -hmm. it costs us uh, hundreds of dollars every time we do this and yet our price don't seem to come up any. Well, when this milk goes into your tank, Dick, it's immediately cooled down to what, 40 degrees or cooler? 38 to 40. I yeah. try to keep mine a little bit cooler, uh, 37, 38. And uh, when the milk cools down to that temperature, then it shuts off, is that right. correct? The mm -hmm. machine shuts off. And uh, now when it's transferred into the truck tank, the truck that takes it off of your farm, there is a little, if any, temperature rise, isn't that so? Very little. The, the tractor trailer that picks it up or the truck, whichever it might be, is an insulated uh, box on the back end of the truck, and it's kept at the same temperature. I mean, it's unloaded within probably five, six hours and into another cooling vat. Yeah. While we've been here today, we uh, have noticed a fine-looking truck with uh, NFO painted on it quite prominently. Uh, who does this truck belong to and what's it used for, Dick? Well, Don Foster, uh, he's an NFO member from Herkimer. He, uh, about uh, two years ago, we was having problems with truckers uh, picking up our beef production and moving it into our NFO plants. Uh, so the NFO members here in Herkimer County uh, come up with the money, some of them several hundred dollars, and loaned it to Don to buy this truck with. And Don runs the truck uh, four or five, sometimes six days a week, picking up the production in New York State. He starts right here in Herkimer County, and he'll go way up as far as the Canadian border. We just had an invitation from your 10-year-old to come in the house for coffee, and uh, I think I'm ready. How about you? I'm sure well, the crew is, too. Maybe the crew is. I'm not. I don't like coffee. I drink don't milk. Don't you really? Well, I really don't. I don't I'll drink coffee at all. I'll tell you what. It's milking time now, and uh, so we'll let you go to work. And uh, we'll go in and have some coffee. May I thank you for your hospitality today? Fine. It's glad to have you here. Thank you so much. And uh, that's Dick Ewell. Quite a guy, isn't he? He certainly is, Bill.
And I don't have to tell you now how impressed he was with the humanitarian attitude of his fellow NFO members in that part of New York State when he did have that fire. They came to the rescue. Rick, if I were a dairy farmer and not a member of NFO, and you were trying to sell me on joining NFO, what in a few words would you say to me? Bill, today with the tremendous investment that the young people are faced with in developing into the dairy business, it has only seems fitting and fair that they should receive a just return for their labor and their investment. And there is only one way that I can see whereby these young people can solidify their future, can develop into the leadership that we need in agriculture, not only today, but tomorrow. And that's for to express themselves in terms of marketing and bargaining. The two go hand in hand. Just to market is futile. But to market and bargain, and they have to do this and become involved themselves, not allowing someone else. They have to do it through their own initiative. And the only organization that I have been able to come across who allows the American farmer to establish from the base concept of American business, in other words, a price tag for his production mm -hmm. so that he can sustain himself and feed his family and pay his taxes and develop into a future leader and businessman is the National Farmers Organization. And he himself can accept or reject the terms of sale for his commodity and put that value on his labor and his management ability and not allow someone else just to pay him sort of what's left over. And this is my appeal, and I think that farmers in, uh, in America today are, are ready to express themselves in exactly these terms, uh, contract-wise, through their own efforts, based on working together all across the nation in a nationwide organization uh, to price their production based on a cost of production and a reasonable profit. Rick, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you on our show. It certainly is my pleasure to have been here. Ben. Thanks so much. My special studio guest this week on U.S. Farm Report has been Mr. Rick Avila, who is assistant director in the Dairy Commodity Department at the National Farmers Organization. Of course, our on-the-spot guest was Mr. Dick Yule, of Herkimer County, New York. U.S. Farm Report is seen on this station each week at this same time. Until we meet again, so long, everybody. Mm -hmm.